Good morning, and welcome to this week's View on Africa. I'm Stephanie Walters. I'm the head of the Peace and Security Research Program at the Institute for Security Studies, and I also cover the DRC. Um, today we're going to talk about some of the many developments that have taken place in the Congo in the last uh, month. Um, first, I'm going to look at the, um, how we got to the point where Joseph Kabila decided not to stand for a third mandate, uh, talk a little bit about the region and its role in that decision, and then later on turn to some of the um, ongoing electoral issues that we still would like to see addressed before we can uh, have credible elections in the country. So first of all, I, I think it's nice that um, after many briefings on this subject, we can start with something positive, which is that Joseph Kabila uh, nominated a successor candidate last week on Wednesday, uh, I'm sorry, on Thursday, that person is Ramazani Shadari. I'll come back to him a little bit later. Um, and this is a positive thing. Uh, we all know that if Kabila had persisted in his um, attempts to stand for a third term in the Congo against the Congolese constitution, that would likely have led to um, extreme short-term and medium-term instability in the country. So it's a very positive um, development. And I think we should um, look a little bit at how it came to, to, came to be about. And I think that uh, a lot of the credibility, or the, sorry, the credit for, for achieving this does come from the Congolese population. Um, we've seen since 2015 substantial engagement by the Congolese um, on a number of different levels. Both civil society channeling uh, popular resistance to Kabila standing, we see, we've seen the opposition do that, but we've, we've really seen a groundswell of popular opinion that has, that, has, that has made itself very manifest on a number of different occasions in the DRC. And of course, every time that we do see this, and we've seen it not just in Kinshasa, but in Lubumbashi, in Goma, in Bukavu, in many different cities in the Congo, um, we have a very strong security response, a very violent security response from the Congolese security apparatus. So there has been a very high cost to civilians um, to this um, ongoing pressure on Kabila not to stand. Um, and I think we have to recognize that um, it's, it's that, um, that, that popular pressure which created greater instability that um, I think convinced many of the key players in the region that it wouldn't be a good idea for Kabila to continue to, to remain in office or to stand for a third term. So I think the trigger in many ways was this popular pressure and we should acknowledge that. I'll come back to that a little bit later about where, where that might go now. Um, and so in the region, we've had Angola consistently, and we've talked about this many times, taking the lead now uh, there on the DRC. And we know that Angola has a very long border with the DRC. It's been a country that has always played an important role in the politics of that country. It's also trained the military and so on. And Angola has really, since about 2015, made it quite clear um, increasingly publicly, but also of course behind the scenes, that it thinks that um, Kabila trying to find a way to stay on for a third mandate would lead to greater instability. So it has really spearheaded those regional efforts to try and get him to stand down and to nominate a successor. Um, this, is, this is very significant. Um, in more recent times, we've also, of course, seen changes of leadership in other key SADC countries, notably South Africa and Zimbabwe. And I think that there is now a group, or at least an alignment between South Africa and Angola on where Congo needs to go. And this, is, this has been very effective in the last few months, and certainly, in my view, contributed to the outcome that we saw last week. Um, I, I don't want to, of course, ignore the fact that there's been significant pressure from key Western countries, the sort of more traditional donors, the United States, the European Union, uh, Belgium, France, a whole group of, of different countries from the UN Security Council, and to some extent also from the African Union, which has grown more vocal on what needs to be done in the DRC um, since the beginning of this year. Um, of course, there have been sanctions imposed by the US and by the European Union. Um, there was the threat of additional sanctions being imposed directly on members of Kabila's family uh, in the lead up to the big decision that was taken last week. And I think that those have had uh, some effect, of course, as well. There, there, there is the effect of having uh, there being consequences to the kinds of, of, of actions that have been taken by the Kabila government, in particular in response to the civilian protests. So that's played a role as well. 
I think one of the questions we have though still is where is Sadek in all of this? Now we know that many Sadek countries on an individual basis, on a bilateral basis, have played a really important role, but Sadek as an organization has been, if anything, publicly uh, quite supportive of Kabila over the last three years. In 2016 it essentially, well it endorsed a uh, political agreement that had been mediated by the African Union and which was uh, very clearly inadequate to resolving that crisis. It didn't have language about Kabila's third mandate, it didn't have language about when the election should be held. And subsequently Angola was a key player in pushing Kabila back to the negotiations which led to the conclusion of the December 31st political accords, which were far more inclusive but which we now know, of course, haven't been fully implemented either. So that is a big question. Where is Sadek in all of this? Today, uh, a week after this announcement by Kabila, um, we've seen Angola already uh, very vocal on what else needs to happen, and I think that this is a very positive thing. That's what we're trying to encourage the region to do, is not to see Kabila standing down as, as the, the end of this particular issue or the end of this process. In fact, it's just one step in what we need to see in the DRC over the next five months. So Angola has already uh, said very clearly uh, through the, their foreign minister that we need to see the full application of the December 31st political accords. And what that means is that we need to see a liberalization of the political space, access to media, freedom of assembly. We also need to see the, um, the release of key political prisoners from La Lucha and Filimbi and people like Jean-Claude Muyambo. Um, the Angolan minister also spoke of the need to be inclusive. I think that's, a, of course, a reference to Moise Katumbi, who was prevented from uh, registering as a presidential candidate as he was not allowed back into the country two weeks ago. So it's, it's, it seems as though the region is, is engaged in this, I think, for the, for the long haul. Um, we have yet to see how it's going to take that kind of pressure forward though and I think that in particular when it comes to these types of issues specifically around elections we really need to see Sadek uh, coming to the party here and taking a lead and making some strong statements about what it wants to see and of course also some constructive suggestions about how it can support a credible process in the DRC. And again just to reiterate why are we so why is it so important that this process has credibility? Um, I think that what we've seen essentially is over the last few years is, a, is an erosion of the fabric of trust between civilians and the Congolese government. There is no trust today in any of the institutions of government, um, whether it be the cabinet or it's the independent ele electoral commission or it's the constitutional court. And so that means that the electorate and, the, and large parts of the population simply don't believe that the government is going to deliver credible elections. So we haven't um, resolved the question of instability uh, in that country and in my view, and I think this, is, this isn't just a view, it's a, it's, 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 it's a fact, we will see greater instability in the DRC if we have elections that lack credibility. And of course that's what the region doesn't want to see. So that's really what's, what's behind all of this. Um, and so I think we, we have a, a SADEC summit um, in the next few days. Um, DRC was also on a mini summit agenda that took place yesterday in Luanda. Uh, Joseph Kabila did not attend, but neither did Museveni, neither did a, a series of other regional presidents. It was attended by, of course, the Angolan president as well as the president of Gabon and of Congo Brazzaville. Um, and it um, supported Kabila's decision. And then afterwards we heard from the Angolan minister that there's still much that needs to be done. So that, that's um, that point. Um, I think that um, the, the question now about what can the region do is relevant because we don't really know what Kabila intends to do. So we know what he's done, which is he's nominated someone to succeed him. Now this particular person does not have a strong political profile. He does not have a political base. This is not somebody who um, stands out within the ruling party as a, as, a, as a leader, as a key player, as somebody who has a popular, uh, who, who's known popularly. So he's, he's someone who's been in some ways in the shadows um, and who is really, I think, a creation of the Kabila era. He's someone who knew the father as well. So does this mean that Kabila intends to continue to control power from behind the scenes? And if that is what he wants to do, then how open is he really going to be to more pressure from the region to hold credible elections? And so that's why this is all, these are the questions that, that we really want to, to try and answer over the coming weeks um, and, and months. Um, <clears throat> so 
I want to turn now some attention to the actual issues around the elections. And we've, we've mentioned these again, again and again. Uh, we have to continue to mention them because they haven't been sufficiently addressed. Um, one of those is the voters' role. Um, the organization, the Francophonie, um, did an audit of the voters' role and found between 6 and 10 million voters, registered voters, who can't be matched with biometric data or with pictures. Now, no one is suggesting that that's necessarily all um, due to some kind of fraud, but what is necessary is an audit of that voters' role. And this is one of the key issues. The uh, Independent Electoral Commission did respond to that by saying that it would publish the list of registered voters by July 10th. It's now August 15th and we haven't seen that. So I think that is a key concern. Again, just to remind us all that if the Independent Electoral Commission wanted to create credibility, which it of course needs to do, it should have met that, that first date. Um, the other really divisive issue are the voting machines. Now, there's the, the, the basic um, issue, which is, is it even legal? Because the Constitution doesn't make provisions for electronic voting machines to be used. So that's one issue. The second issue is that there's um, widespread distrust in these voting machines. They've been introduced at the at sort of the last minute. They were ordered under dubious circumstances. There's already been a lot of talk about how that uh, procurement process worked. And of course, there's a lot of concern that perhaps they're being introduced because somehow they could be used to provide fraud Fraudulent, uh, fraudulent outcome, fraudulent results. So there are two different uh, concerns. One is they could be used to, to steal the election. Um, and the other one is that they could cause widespread chaos. Now we're talking about a huge country um, where there is very little uh, access to electricity uh, throughout the country. There probably will be generators in some of the key voting booths, but um, you know, th th if these things run out of battery, there's really no way to recharge them. Um, many of the um, voters will be using, in fact, most of the voters will be using this kind of technology for the very first time, which leaves it open to interference, assistance from, from voting officials and so on. So it's a highly controversial uh, tool to be using in a context which already lacks confidence. So that, that is a big issue that, that still needs to be resolved. Um, now, we believe that 35,000 of these are already on the way. And of course, we have to remember that the Congolese government's argument is we're transporting uh, machines instead of transporting um, thousands and thousands of tons of, of ballots, of voting material. And so that's, that's their argument about why this has been introduced. Finally, and, and not least at all, is the hostile political environment. So that is really the, the best way, I think, to describe the, the situation in the DRC. Um, at the moment, it's by no means a, f uh, a level playing field. Um, the, the opposition um, has to still request uh, uh, permission to be able to hold meetings. Marches are, are still banned. Every once in a while, someone is able to do something or is granted permission to do something, um, but it's, it's certainly not um, open and free. Access to media is not uh, available uh, to most of the, of the political parties. Um, and we still have people being arrested and harassed and uh, p possibly, you know, to some extent, uh, people disappearing and, and actually being murdered. So there are many, many, many concerns. Of course, Katumbi, uh, Moise Katumbi tried to return to the Congo two weeks ago. He was prevented from doing so by the Congolese authorities who would not allow him to cross the border back into his own country in spite of the fact that he knew that once he did do that, he would be immediately arrested. So it's, it's hard to see that as anything but a, a political attempt to exclude a key rival. On the other hand, we have Jean-Pierre Bemba, who returned rather surprisingly to the political scene after being acquitted of crimes against humanity by the International Criminal Court. Uh, he returned a few weeks ago. He was allowed to return to Kinshasa. He was allowed to, he was welcomed by, by really tens of thousands of people. That was allowed. Um, in many ways, a shrewd move for a change on behalf of the Congolese government to show that, yes, they are open to to different people of different political backgrounds. Um, but there were a number of other issues. Bemba wasn't allowed to go and live in his own home um, and, and, and so on. So I think that um, we, have, we have a very difficult uh, few months ahead. There's also the question of whether or not Bemba's uh, candidacy will actually be approved by the Independent Electoral Commission. There have been murmurings that he might be disqualified on the grounds that he uh, it has been convicted of corruption charges. That's debatable. First of all, he hasn't been convicted. And second of all, the charge, which is um, influencing witnesses in his trial, m the definition, does that meet the definition of corruption? So, so some other big issues. 
And then finally, I, um, so those are, those are the big upcoming issues in the immediate term that I want to just call our attention to. And then finally, I just want to end with uh, a fairly recent development. Um, yesterday, the opposition met in, in the DRC, and I'm talking about the UDPS, um, the MLC, uh, the Ensemble, the Mouise Katumbi's party, Martin Fayoulou's party, Freddy Matungulu's party. Um, yes, they all met um, and signed a common declaration um, where they uh, make some key demands. Um, one of them is the return of Mouise Katumbi and that he be allowed to register as a presidential candidate. Also, the uh, elimination of the voting machines, uh, the audit, uh, the cleanup of the voters' role, um, that key political prisoners be released, um, that the UDPS delegate at the Independent Electoral Commission be replaced. That person is someone who's been co-opted by the government, and so this has been an issue that the UDPS has been uh, pushing for for quite some time. There's also the question of uh, Etienne Chisikedi's funeral, that that be held in Kinshasa. Um, and um, the last issue is that Jean-Pierre uh, Bemba's candidacy be vali validated. So that's where the um, opposition stands at the moment. Um, just a few more comments. I'm, I'm, I think that we, we've often seen um, criticisms of Congolese opposition, their failure perhaps to have the right strategy at the right time, to rally when it's met with, um, with, with obstacles and so on. Um, I think that uh, we're seeing, um, at least right now, uh, a fairly organized opposition response. Um, and we're also seeing civil society trying to be constructive about what it can do um, on these next steps with regards to the technical, many of the technical issues around around the election. And I think that those are those are those are positive developments. Um, and I will end it there.